Perfect. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our LFX security webinar. This is the second of our LFX tools series, and we're really glad that you could join us today. We're going to be introducing you to LFX security and sharing a bit about how our tool is enabling projects to make security part of the development process. Um, so first, we're going to give a bit of context around the Linux Foundation's security initiative. Then we're going to dive into a demo, uh, which is, I'm sure, what everyone is here for. Uh, we're going to cover some of the capabilities of LFX security, including vulnerability detection and fix recommendations, license compliance management, and more. Um, feel free at any point in time to ask your questions on chat or in the Q&A feature here on the Zoom webinar. Um, we want to make this as engaging and relevant a session as possible for you, so please do ask away. Um, we have a number of moderators here to field your questions, and we will also have plenty of time at the end uh, during a, a Q&A session to ask you know, any other questions and, and go over your, your questions in detail. Finally, this webinar will be recorded. So if you want to revisit this or if you have any colleagues that would like to, uh, to hear the, uh, about LFX security as well, uh, we will be posting this on our Linux Foundation YouTube channel. So you'll be able to, to access that um, pretty soon. We'll send the link uh, to you after today's webinar. So we'll be able to, uh, to get that up and running pretty quickly and you'll be able to reference this as often as you like. I would like to start us off by introducing our speakers. Um, so Shubra Carr, our CTO and general manager of products here at the Linux Foundation, will be driving our presentation and demo today. Uh, he's joined by our partners at, the, at SNCC. Um, the CTO of Global Alliances, Geva Solomonovic, as well as a number of moderators here from the Linux Foundation side and from SNCC. With that, uh, I will turn things over to Shubra and he is going to get started. All right, great. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, all right, uh, welcome folks to this webinar. Um, so the key goal that we're gonna talk about uh, is like how do we build more sustainable open source projects? And the word uh, sustainable is uh, very important because uh, for most open source projects, sustainable actually means it's more secure. Um, again, driving enterprise adoption and whatnot, right? So, uh, you know, how can we actually help these projects succeed, right? We, we were looking at different areas of uh, challenges for uh, you know, open source projects and the world runs on open source, right? And uh, critical projects that are basically important, you depend on day to day, they need much more than just a source control system or a version control system to scale. And uh, as you look into the ecosystem, the projects must have a finger on the pulse of the entire uh, community. And, uh, you know, with tools that, you know, are tailored for key stakeholders, because, you know, not everybody is just a developer or a contributor. You have maintainers, you have community managers, you have um, outreach people, marketeers, and many more, uh, documentation writers. So, over the number of years, right, the Linux Foundation has been around. Um, most of these projects have evolved a proven methodology, how to, you know, help address these challenges. And they started small, and then, you know, they transformed into these, uh, from fledging projects into these category leaders, like the Kubernetes and the Node.js of the world. So what we did is uh, we have tried to operationalize this approach, and we came up with a tool chain. And that tool chain is called LFX. Now, LFX, think about it as a toolkit. Um, you know, it adds value at every uh, aspect of open source development. Uh, it's built uh, by the Linux Foundation engineers and the community. And uh, various tools in the kitty, you know, primarily things like insights for, you know, monitoring the health of the project, the developer activity, everything from code commits, to the ecosystem activity in terms of you know your outreach whatnot, uh, security that's the product we are going, going to focus in detail today. Uh, challenges around vulnerability detection, uh, you know, uh, IP management and whatnot. And then we have other tools in um, there for tools like EasyCLA 
which address the challenges of productivity for developers, particularly for projects which have, um, you know, CLA requirements, uh, contribute to license agreement requirements for, you know, uh, which need to be signed off for companies as well as individuals. And uh, we also have tools there which, uh, uh, you know, aid uh, you to grow the community. Uh, by hiring mentees, getting a lot of mentors, and we have thousands of uh, community members uh, who are uh, actively involved in these projects, first timers. Uh, this service really helps them. We also have a crowdfunding service, you know, helps projects to raise uh, the funds when you are just kicking off and, uh, you know, going on to become larger projects. They have infrastructure costs and whatnot. Um, similarly, we have community events like, you know, you're doing your own branded events across different cities. We have a training portal if the project wants to enhance its uh, skills in the community, they can launch courses. Uh, we have a project control center uh, where you can, con you know, manage all your IT needs, um, all your legal uh, agreements and whatnot. So it's an entire toolkit. Today, we're going to focus more on the security part of it, but feel free to, you know, check out the other uh, tools in the chain. Uh, the website for that is just lfx.dev. Uh, that's where you can find all these tools. So... Again, improving open source security is not something that's been new to us. Like we have been, it's been a key objective for us for many years. And uh, to face the problem, we said, hey, you know what, to get started, we need to answer three very simple questions. Uh, first of all, what is the most important shared software in the world, right? Now, can we index them by packaging, package uh, version numbers, by industry and sector, by criticality score, who is using it. Uh, but more than the usage, it's also who wrote it. Uh, who are the maintainers? Who are the developers? What is the project health? Like, is it growing healthy? It's being hitting steady state? Is it like trending downwards? Are they getting contributions? But more importantly, how can we also make it secure? as along with you know keeping it healthy are there tools for you know contributors to look at or these project governance committees to look at to ensure that security is not an afterthought but it's part of the development process right so to answer these questions <clears throat> uh, you know the linux foundation started a few years back on uh, initiatives like cii the core infrastructure initiative which was more around the best practices and we encourage people to uh, submit, you know, proper audits, uh, make sure there is, uh, you know, a lot of best practices that are documented um, and and we put badging, like, you know, some, uh, and we also ask them to, you know, scan their projects, upload those reports, uh, do proper bug bashes and whatnot. And we started giving these badges, which were, you know, passing gold, silver, platinum, and, and we had like huge adoption or about 3,600 projects that were using the industry CII badge. And then as we started evolving, we started getting more projects with defined, you know, uh, frameworks for IP management, in particularly licensing, like SPDX is a great framework. Uh, we had a to-do group where a lot of communities were engaging and sharing security best practices. We recently formed an, uh, a project called OpenSSF, uh, again, cross-industry collaboration, but we're looking to define, uh, you know, what are the global standards, right, for security, and this now also includes standards. And, uh, but again, just best practices weren't enough. There needed to be tooling that are easily accessible um, to our community. So we had a few earlier, particularly with projects like Fosology and then uh, Craigit, uh, which was more like, you know, measuring code attribution. We had a special project stood up called Red Team. Um, again. Uh, different areas, some of them were around, you know, encryption, uh, some of them were under hardware security, um, you know, code packaged on embedded software, right? So a lot of initiatives, but then, you know, we started building a comprehensive tool chain and that was in LFX and we have launched security and insights. Um, you know, insights basically gives you the whole idea of the ecosystem and metrics that you can look at and security actually gives gets you you know, deep dive into really the security parameters that you're measuring your projects against. And we are looking to integrate these tools with the best practices. It's not a small endeavor. It's going to take a long time. Um, but 
also we started initiatives uh, with like the laboratory for innovators at harvard it was called the leash initiative initiative and we did a, a big census um, cii had a census one and then we did a census two i won't have time to go into uh, um, deep into all of these but you know uh, these materials are available uh, i would highly encourage you to check these out around these different initiatives but net net like we need a multi-dimensional approach right just one tooling or a best practice or a census isn't gonna solve security open source security it has to be a combination of these three working you know uh, in symphony so talking about lfx security the tool itself right um so again as we kind of started talking with community members we said like what are the key areas that you know uh, you are worried about, <laughs> or like if you if you were to use security tools, what do you uh, worry about? Um, you know, uh, in terms of exposure, risk exposure. So, key areas we got was like first of all, like you know, if we put these metrics out, the hackers might actually know about these vulnerabilities and they're going to exploit our code. But it's kind of counter logic because you know hackers don't need our tools to exploit our code base they'll figure it the way out. They probably know about it uh, much earlier than us. So we need that visibility to quickly identify and fix these vulnerabilities. Many projects, you know, they just wondered, we are not getting enterprise adoption. And uh, maybe, you know, uh, we have great momentum in the community, but when a large enterprise tries to use an open source project, the project fails to, you know, pass the security scans, stringent security scans. And that becomes a, you know, gate um, to, you know, getting enterprise adoption. Um, exposure to IP risk was another top priority. Like people didn't quite know like the licensing schema and software is uh, now written in a sandwich. It's not just your native code. You are dependent on N number of upstream libraries and packages. And if you uh, have a particular licensing scheme in your open source project, you do want to ensure that, you know, you don't have that IP risk exposure, right? And then but overall, uh, you know, there needs to be trust, right? Um, the more transparent we are, the better um, the community trusts us, right? Um, and the end users trust us. So we basically started with this project, we ran our tools, and we scanned more than 10,000 repositories across, you know, close to 400 Linux Foundation projects. And we did discover a lot of vulnerabilities, <clears throat> you know, close to quarter million of them. And a lot of them, had like low hanging fixes, uh, which could be simply done by an upgrading a dependent library version. Um, and some of these vulnerabilities did get fixed, right? But still there is a big backlog. So we are trying to get our communities to, you know, uh, step up, look at these in details and take action, right? So that we can improve as a global community. Now for these tooling, uh, my team didn't really have a lot of stuff built out. And uh, we spoke with uh, uh, Snake and like Geva, my friend is here and he and his uh, co-founder uh, co CEO, they said, hey, this is slam dunk. Like we should really join hands and, uh, you know, work together for improving the health of the open source community. So we developed this tool in partnership with uh, Snake. And the first version of this tool focuses primarily on vulnerability detection. Um, and we'll, we are also collaborating with other industry players where we will diversify into different areas of, you know, software bill of materials into static code analysis and whatnot, right? But this is a very strategic partnership and a uh, uh, big shout out to Snake for collaborating with us on this. So, you know, who, who, who can use this tool and why would they use this tool, right? So we have three primary personas, right? If you think about it that way. Obviously, the project maintainers and contributors, um, that's probably like the biggest bank for their buck uh, is that, that group. And end, uh, end of the day, like, you know, uh, you always struggle between functionality and security. You want to get functionality out there quicker, and you don't really have the time or resources to do research. Um, and even if there are bugs out there, you know, there isn't a verified bug backlog. And... Uh, you know, uh, what we are providing with this tooling is that verification, is that trusted, uh, uh, you know, source of data. And we'll talk about it more, how we actually verify that these bugs are not false positives. But essentially, the more secure and trusted projects get that option, and you can really scale your community efforts, right? Um, with community-driven 
fixes, right? Like it's not just one maintainer has to fix it. Now for many Linux Foundation open source projects, there are governance groups, right? And uh, these governance groups, they are special interest groups. We call them as SIGs. They have been set up to focus on security best practices from day one of the development life cycle. Um, badging, right? Uh, how do we know, like what's the maturity of a stage uh, of a project? Projects go from all the way from sandboxes to incubation to graduation. The digital badging, uh, particularly in, around security, um, definitely helps define maturity. And obviously proper IP management and licensing. We talked about this. So you really uh, want to have a very um, seamless and smooth software bill of materials policy, which is transparent to all your end users as well as your contributors. And then all our projects we know, like, you know, they are funded by these member companies and our corporate sponsors. So for them, and many of them are actually end users or adopters of the project. So how do they, pro you know, protect their open source investments? Many companies have uh, commercial products built on these product uh, on on these open source projects. Um, you know, so you really need to guard against, you know, uh, security risk. You need to guard against IP risk. Uh, make sure these are enterprise ready and sustainable, right? So <clears throat> this is what, who we build the tool for. Now, there are a lot of features. I'll not walk through all of those, but in a nutshell, um, you know, it's not a repo. It's not a single developer or a maintainer looking at their uh, piece of the puzzle. But from a global governance standpoint, uh, we build that, uh, we build centralized project dashboards. Now, obviously, developers can look at the slice of their data to the projects they are contributing, but that aggregated project context is very important. And a project could be 10 repos, it could be 100 repos, it could be thousands of repos, right? Uh, can you see that aggregated picture? Um, obviously, we scan automatically, um, you know, every day. Uh, we have evidences from trusted sources which help us validate that the bugs that we find are real, they are reproducible. Um, there's a vulnerability database uh, that, you know, on the back end, SNCC uh, updates uh, with their security experts as well. Uh, we look at the entire upstream dependency tree uh, so that it's not just your native code. You know, 80% uh, of your code is borrowed from other open source projects. So you need to uh, look at the entire chain, how secure that, uh, you know, supply chain is. And uh, there are fixed recommendations. So, you know, some of them are easy fixes, some of them are not but we do scan for licenses so that you can start doing you know, effective license compliance. Uh, we also start plotting visually the releases um, that are happening when these uh, you know, code releases so that you can see, okay, well, maybe did we actually inject a lot of bugs with this particular release? And net net, we built it neutral to source control systems, right? You could be on Git, you could be using Git, GitHub, Gerrit, GitLab, we don't really care. Um, you know, it has to be a trusted agnostic solution. So with that being said, I'll turn it over uh, for more deep dive to my friend Geva here, uh, who can talk about the engine that is powering this solution. Geva? It's uh, Shubra, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me here today. And uh, thanks for going over this great initiative in uh, LFX security, helping make the the entire community more secure, bring security in a more transparent way to the to the ecosystem, and ultimately raise the confidence of the end consumers of all these great open source uh, projects. And so, what, one of the things they really like here about this collaboration between Sneak and Elfix Security is is their ability to bring two key areas of the Sneak tech into Elfix Security to make it very very effective. One is uh, the ability of uh, Sneak to detect the right open source packages. And then to the leveraging of our vulnerability databases, as, as you mentioned, and both pieces are, are important. The detection piece is important because when you're looking at your overall security stature, you want to make sure that you're actually accurately and correctly mapping all the open source, uh, all the open source packages you're using, including the upstream ones, as you mentioned, and put them in this context of a full dependency tree as, uh, as articulated here on the slide on the left. This really helps understand where vulnerabilities are, are coming in into your application and what type of fixes and, and version upgrades you need to do to, to fix them. This, this uh, deep detection, which includes also those transitive uh, dependencies, actually does allow you correctly to map your license compliance. So is there one of these nested or transitive dependencies, which including 
a type of license that's not compatible with uh, the license you're trying to go out to market with your open source uh, open source package. And so overall, there's an incongruence of the, let's call it the legal compliance uh, framework for, for using your open source. So these are the types of things with the deep detection we're, we're able to, to flag. And the sneak until database not only flags all, all the great vulnerabilities, it actually allows us to tell you whether the right upgrades to take the actions to fix the vulnerabilities you're fixing. So it's it's not only about uh, uh, detection and visibility, it's actually goes much deeper in terms of uh, actionability and what you can do to improve your security posture. So if you can go to the next slide here, just a few words about our, our vulnerability database. And so uh, when we look at it, there's all these different dimensions where which you can use to, to qualify uh, what a good vulnerability da database is all about. First and the topmost one is on the comprehensiveness of it. So here we try to cover all the all the ecosystems, all the programming languages from uh, Java to JavaScript to Go to Rust and and even even the smaller, more and more esoteric ones. And, and not only the breadth, but also the depth in each one of them, having more vulnerabilities, uh, having the deeper vulnerabilities, those that are harder to harder to, to find in, in other public databases. And the second main dimension here is the timeliness. And so over time, yes, vulnerabilities propagate between different databases and different places. But one of the things we really try to do and our security team does a great job of is finding those vulnerabilities earlier and codifying them, putting them in the database so we can communicate them back to our, uh, to our users so they can take the action faster and so under the consideration that the hackers know about these vulnerabilities earlier, the earlier the good guys know about them, the more time you have to fix them before the, uh, before the hackers have opportunity to, to take leverage. And so in, in a bigger perspective, Sneak is working closely with, with a lot of, uh, with a lot of the community members. So the LF is one of our biggest partners, of course, and the LFX security is, is this amazing initiative, but we also, Try to help bring uh, vulnerabilities uh, to the uh, to the CV database. Sneak is a CV numbering authority. We help maintainers, uh, like a lot of the folks here, uh, actually disclose vulnerabilities and and do responsible disclosure and stuff like that. And and overall, other than the community, our database is already true and tested. Uh, also by the industry, we have amazing amazing partners which are leveraging the Sneak vulnerability database to make open source security available through their own products, companies like Datadog, like IBM, like Docker, and, and like Rapid7. Next slide. And so how is it that we're able to build this uh, amazing vulnerability database? Just a few of the things that go inside. One, of course, we track all the public uh, vulnerability databases which are out there. Every community has one, Java has one, Go has one, PHP has one. But also there's vendor-led uh, uh, vulnerability database. Apache uh, does a good job, uh, for example. And so at the basic level, Sneak tracks all these and ag aggregates all them for, uh, for your benefit. And not only are we aggregating, we're also enriching the data, providing developer-friendly curated uh, advisory. So something you want to read, something you're able to read and is, and is uh, informative uh, for you. We augment that with our own proprietary research. So Sneak security experts do open up open source projects, look for big vulnerabilities. We have a few big uh, branded discoveries and a few uh, zero days we discovered over, over the years. All those get incorporated, of course, automatically into the vulnerability database. You don't need to worry about that. The biggest kind of most sophisticated thing uh, we do is set up these threat intelligence systems, which are listening to open source chatter across the web. Anywhere people are talking about open source vulnerabilities, might be a Jira board, might be some GitHub commits, might be a GitHub issue where a vulnerability may be discussed, but if it's not disclosed and it's not packaged and it's not put in a, in a database for the service of everybody, then that type of insight gets, gets lost. And so our threat intelligence systems capture all that chatter, our security team review every single one of them to make sure there's no uh, false positives. And those ultimately end up in our uh, database for, for the entire benefit of uh, everybody. And saying all that, we still can't do everything by ourselves. So Sneak has a great community relationship. We frequently get contributions from maintainers, from other researchers, from uh, uh, 
from people from bug bounties, people just looking and finding open source vulnerabilities uh, all around. We do help with the uh, responsible disclosure. Uh, we do help with writing up the content, and ultimately, we do help by propagating the discovery to to all our users. And and last last piece here is our collaboration with the academia, where we have outstanding relationships with the PhD labs, like in Berkeley and Virginia Tech and Waterloo, where our security team exchanged with them methods, data, discoveries, and often they do these very deep, uh, very deep type of uh, researches, and they do find a lot of vulnerabilities. Again, we help them with the disclosure, and we bring all those findings to the community in a massive way through our database and through partnerships like this with LFX. Perfect. Back Thank to you. you Thank you, Giver. All right, so let's uh, we'll do a quick demo, and we'll again. This is openly accessible to everyone. So the easiest way to get there is um, again. I'm going to type in the URL. It's just security.lfx.dev, and uh, you can see here we have already onboarded um, almost all of the Linux Foundation projects. Like you know, there are cards where you know we have groups of projects. Like if you think about a project like CNCF. Um, you know, there are probably close to 75 projects under here, right? So <clears throat> how do you read the data? So <clears throat> the vulnerabilities are broken down by severities, you know, high, medium, low, and these are stack rank based on CVSS scores and, you know, essentially risk index. Um, and, uh, you know, we are aggregating all these uh, vulnerabilities numbers and how many issues are open, how many of them are fixable, how many are fixed how many languages uh, you know these package these uh, projects use how many upstream dependencies you have and unique type of licenses we find now if i have to go and look into a particular project let's take the use case of kubernetes um, as soon as i log in i actually start looking at over time and again if you're looking you know you can look into various time filters right like you can look into um, you know years months weeks what not um, but you can see there are certain spikes in this uh, in this chart where you know you see a lot of these vulnerabilities coming in. Now, vulnerabilities directly don't depend on the release. And like you know, when you look at version uh, control systems, like you know, Kubernetes has hundreds of repos, and every repo this is kind of the main repo, but every repo could have like you know n number of uh, versions that they're pushing out on GitHub. But for the main ones, what you want to filter down and see like, okay, was there a particular version that was re released when this spike actually happened? Helps you start doing the visual correlation. And if you find a lot of bugs into that particular uh, GitHub repo, you are able to do the mental math. Um, we do break this down into the languages. And obviously this is you know, uh, preaching to the choir, we pretty much know that most of the code base in Kubernetes is written in Golang, but there are other uh, languages there as well. And you have the complete history of the tracking, but now if you start getting into the actual issues, the bugs that were detected, uh, these are global numbers, but then we have a repo by repo breakdown. So let's take a look at a couple, right? So again, this is kind of a uh, plugin for Kubernetes in terms of like cloud provider. And uh, you can start looking at the different types of issues and you can also uh, see like some of them actually have a weakness enumeration or a uh, actual CVE record associated with them in the national vulnerability database. Um, and some of them don't, right? It might just be a weakness. It's not yet identified as a vulnerability. And we indicate like if it is, is there an easy fix available to uh, or not, right? So if I have to expand on this, let's take the case of this one. So um, again, there is credit provided to the person who reported it. Um, you know, this one looks simple. It's probably in a dependent library called tar. And the uh, remediation here is like upgrading tar to a version uh, 2.x or higher that fixes this vulnerability. And the vulnerability is essentially a file, arbitrary file overwrite. But if I want to essentially know um, much more about what this vulnerability or this weakness really is, we have the, uh, the details of like, you know, that vulnerability along with the references uh, that were found in various GitHub commits or, you know, sometimes there are security advisories um, that are logged in the National Vulnerability Database. Uh, in this, in case if it is a weakness enumeration, you similarly have the full detail 
uh, of uh, how this uh, is logged. Now, if there was a hacker report, you might even get a, a reference to how to reproduce those. So here, for example, uh, I have a GitHub commit, which shows you where that vulnerability was injected. I actually have a security advisory that you know NPM, uh, the package manager, sent out, uh, particularly referencing this vulnerability. And there's even a hacker one report. And this is where the collaboration in the community comes together because you know you start looking at the steps, how you know what's the detail, how could somebody reproduce this, right? And is this the same pattern that I'm seeing in my code? Now, <clears throat> uh, if you really want to learn more about this, you know we obviously have more details in the, the CVSS course, and you know uh, we take you into the sneak console there. Um, but uh, and many of them, you know, uh, are look totally different. Like if I look another bug here. Um, Similarly, this is probably the same type, but let's look at a cross scripting error, right? And this cross scripting error, again, this is an easy fix. And you know, there are uh, there is even a pull request which actually uh, shows how to fix it. But like, if you really wanted to create a GitHub issue, you can click this and actually log a GitHub issue against your project. Uh, we are now tying up, uh, working more closely with Snake, where we will be able to do remediation, automatically generate the pull request for actually fixing this uh, particular issue in the database, right? We also look at the entire dependency chain. Uh, so this is like by default, the dependency chain of like how the sausage made in the sausage factory. But if you're really tagging them into filtering just the vulnerable packages in your upstream, and you look into like, okay, let's traverse through the tree. What in the upstream is actually um, has an issue. So if you start looking at these, these point out where those, which packages do have those issues. Okay. And uh, you also look at the associated license type. Now talking about licenses, this is where the software bill of material starts to kick in play because uh, we do scan for all available license types um, in the code base and uh, also in the upstream. And if you're using particular packages, and again, those packages could be in N1 to N number of repositories. If you find a non-permissive or you know a license that's not like uh, matching your licensing schema, you can actually start flagging these, right? Now, <clears throat> on the granularity side or the false positive side, uh, by default, we are scanning develop dev dependencies as well, but this is a setting that you know you can turn on or off. Where you know you might say like, hey, maybe you know in production I do like if you look at JavaScript, Node.js, or other projects, you might be using a number of unit testing tools or whatnot in the in the dev system, and in production you know uh, you don't want to track those dev dependencies. They might still be in your package.json, but we essentially inspect the manifests pull down all the dependencies from the package managers and then do the entire thorough analysis of the sandwich stack, okay? So you can check out more and you know, there's more functionality coming here, but uh, getting back to <clears throat> where we are headed with this, right? So there are more items we are working on as we evolve this uh, uh, solution. Uh, we have started working on a code secrets detection project as well. And I'll show you like what that looks like. Uh, one of the big uh, items in security is the signal to noise ratio, right? Like uh, there could be false positives. Now, I think SNCC does a great job in eliminating most of the false positives, but as we are expanding the solution, uh, you know, we really want to, and we say like, okay, we start detecting code secrets. You really want to weed out like, well, you know, maybe this is a markdown file or this is a readme file. I don't really care if there's a, you know, demo API key in there. So how do you uh, effectively, you know, start, re remove these false positives at scale? We are targeting much richer integration with Snake, particularly around automated remediation. Uh, currently, uh, we have the reporting, but we don't have the automated remediation turned on. This will actually uh, uh, be very powerful. We are also looking at integrating it with the workflow, the developer workflow. And again, this could be written in terms of a GitHub action uh, where you know the developer can actually take or the maintainer can take action against that uh, from their own repository, but the report also flows into that governance view. We are also looking to add support for container scanning, <clears throat> CI systems. Uh, now beyond, um, now integrating about, we talked about like best practices platforms like CII. 
Uh, so that's in our H2 roadmap to create a comprehensive security badge. Uh, software bill of materials, uh, we talked about licensing, but how can you effectively start doing policy management on that, right? Uh, support for C, C++, the kernel essentially was, is all C, and if you look at like it's a root package, it doesn't really have upstream dependencies. Those are rare, but we do need to, uh, you know, start tracking vulnerabilities there. So we might need static code analysis there because it doesn't really have dependencies. Um, and then, you know, how do we start collaborating with, we have started talking with the groups, uh, Infosology and OpenSSF, trying to make this as a, this tool platform, this comprehensive tool platform, uh, kind of the tool of choice, right, for these communities to go and uh, run there, whether it's an academic exercise, whether it's a real, um, quality improvement, uh, have them use this as the, uh, as the reference implementation. So this is a sneak peek into what we are working next on code secret detection. So essentially we are uh, scanning more than 50 secret types, uh, you know, including passwords, tokens, and more, and trying to create a repo level risk score. And obviously, as I said, like we have to squash all those false positives. So everything from, you know, an AWS uh, key to my private uh, PEM file out there to uh, maybe a password assignment or maybe, you know, I have, um, um, you know, uh, PCAP files floating over the network. Uh, where, you know, people have, might use that for a demo scenario, uh, or maybe there's stuff in, I committed in a dev environment, and I, when I went to production, I said, okay, I'm going to delete those uh, keys. Uh, instead of using a password, like a key manager that vault, I hard-coded it. I deleted it in when I pushed the PR to production, but it still stays in the Git commit history, right? So uh, we'll be adding this functionality fairly soon. And uh, again, as we talked about with uh, deeper integration uh, uh, with Sneak, um, the workflow is probably the most important one uh, to really like have a bottoms up uh, momentum behind this so that developers can also start getting immediate value along with the governance committees. Uh, we talk about the automated uh, pull request. So if you actually get like a suggested fix, then you can issue the PR and obviously on container security. Giva, do you want to add um, anything on this one? I think you covered uh, a lot of it, but but just on this uh, right more portion here. So, as as a maintainer, as you're looking at your your security holistically, there's many different things which go into it. Open source uh, security and license compliance are two big ones, and we started with those use cases. But other aspects of of your application and security is the containerization of it, and so the container is a different risk surface. It has different open source components relating to the operating system. If, uh, if your project is typically deployed with Terraform or with other IAC type of uh, infrastructure as code type of solutions, then, okay, what goes into those uh, scripts or recommended best practices? Are you deploying it uh, securely or do you have miscon misconfigurations? And also over, over time, we'll probably add the ability to scan the proprietary code. So the static analysis uh, component on top of all of this. And so through this partnership, you, you'll be able to get comprehensive security on your uh, on your projects all embedded into into the tool coming onto your github workflows and ultimately with automated uh, fixes namely with the pull requests which go directly back into your repo with the recommended fixes perfect thank you Gilbert. all right so i'll open it up for questions but let me uh, tackle some of the basic ones that i know like how do you get access so um, for all the, and again, like I'll, I'll talk about insights a little bit as well, but like if you're on security, like, <clears throat> um, and you need access, but I have super admin, so I have access, but generally you will see like request, uh, you have to log in with an LFID, like that's our global single sign on for all Linux foundation projects. And then if you hit request access, by default, anybody who is a maintainer, anybody who is a contributor to the project, uh, they will get access. If you are part of a governance group or a special interest group focusing on security, all our technical committees, you know, tax and all, they will be getting access. All you need to do is click and just request access and we'll give you access to that project. Um, again, we need to respect the privacy, you know, uh, disclosure policies. That's why, like, it's not just open all to the internet <laughs> right now, right? Uh, so let me pause there um, and see if there are more questions. Uh, Stephanie, can you see? 
Yeah, uh, there's been some great ones coming through here. Uh, Steve Taylor actually uh, asks a question here that relates to just this general get, how to get started. Um, specifically, he's asking about the status of his request and secure my project. So I was hoping maybe Shubra, if you could just talk through a little bit of what that process looks like in, you know, as a project requests uh, getting there, getting added here and, and kind of what that flow looks like and working with our team to get set up. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So when you click secure a project, you essentially get this application form, right? And um, we have this data and it comes to us for approval. As soon as we approve, the project gets onboarded. Now for projects that are already on the Linux Foundation uh, you know, list, we have like close to 400 projects. You don't really need to request us to onboard. They will get onboarded automatically. But for projects which are coming from outside, the way, you know, there is a little bit of an approval process. So what we need is a little bit more uh, context. So what I would highly encourage you if this, you know, um, uh, if your project has not been approved uh, for some time is to essentially just log a ticket with us in our JIRA system. Because what happens is like, um, uh, you know, there is a cost to running this security in terms of infrastructures and all, but if your project is really critical uh, for the open source community, we don't want to, you know, open this up to a million open source project. We are focusing on the most impactful, critical open source projects, which are big impact for the community, right? So, um, like when those kind of requests come in for projects that are not within the Linux Foundation, uh, we run it by our, our technical committee. And as long as they feel, yeah, this is a, actually a very important project, we go ahead and onboard them, right? So I think in this case, your request, uh, we will definitely follow up uh, on this request. I don't know where it's stuck. Um, you don't need to log a separate ticket for this one. We already got your request, uh, but that would be the process, right? Uh, like if you are coming um, and your project is not already a Linux Foundation project. Awesome, thanks Shubra. Uh, another one relating, kind of relating to how to get started. Uh, Steve Fury asks, are we proactively scanning all Linux Foundation projects or do projects need to request you to do so? No, we are proactively scanning all Linux one. We are actually trying to reach out. So many times what happens, some of these projects have a dedicated community manager or a project manager. Um, so if you're not seeing the project on that list, do drop us a Jira ticket because sometimes it's very hard to find who the maintainer or the governance person for that uh, Linux Foundation project is. But um, our initiative is to proactively scan all. So we already have the repository information and everything for most of our projects. But if we are missing you, please feel free to you know log. Like if, all you need to do is you know go here and just log the ticket. It goes into our Jira queue. But yeah, it's proactive. Great. Um, another question here that I'm seeing, and please, if there's any other questions that uh, you have, feel free to ask them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, got another one here around, uh, you know, is the automated fix pull request available now? Uh, no, uh, but we are already uh, are starting the development on that. We should be, uh, we are aiming to release it uh, in a very short time frame. Um, hopefully in the next uh, four to five sprints. Awesome. And quick plug there for the LFX newsletter. Uh, you know, definitely uh, log in and, and join us if you want to get you know, kind of proactive communication around those types of releases. We will be sending that out, you know, on um, to that newsletter channel. Yes, definitely. I think uh, the newsletter is very important. I think that uh, that support is essentially our Jira desk that my engineering team monitors uh, daily. Um, obviously, you know, if you have questions, feel free to drop those in. Um, you know, big again, big shout out to our uh, key strategic partner here, SNCC. And as I said, like we are also working on other open source only uh, projects out there which want to you know contribute to this uh, initiative and be part of the stack right because we are not like it takes a village to be honest uh, no single solution solves uh, the breadth of the security challenges it could be around badging it could be around code it could be around you know secrets it could be around static analysis um, it could be around ip compliance so we are really looking for partners as well to help in this initiative Okay. Awesome. Yeah, Thank you. A couple more 
questions in there? Yeah, so um, Linux, uh, I, I assume uh, why Bob, uh, the question uh, is basically like you're referring to the Linux kernel. Now the, ker the kernel is essentially C, C++. So that's what we currently don't have support for and we have actively starting work on that. So we actually tried basic static code, you know, open source utilities and we found uh, we, we found a lot. <laughs> but the point was like a lot of those were looking at like false positives. So we are actually trying to search for, you know, more mature static analysis uh, solutions out there. Uh, but like upstream, like the Linux kernel doesn't really have uh, dependencies. So like, you know, our mechanism of manifest infection, um, you know, deriving the dependencies from manifest and then looking up the package manager, that doesn't work for the kernel. Yeah, um, Stephanie, I think uh, you wanted to, is there a way to unmute? Uh, sure, I can, I can unmute here. Um, just a quick note to everyone, we are kind of at time, but we will continue taking questions for a few more minutes here. Um, Bye, Papa, I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute you real quickly, and then I see another great question that came through we'll address after that. Just give me one second here. Okay, Bye, uh, you are, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. There we go. All right. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Hi. Yes, you are. Oh, great. Okay. So uh, I think this is the first time I am actually on a Linux uh, security uh, conference. Uh, the idea that I am trying to put across today uh, when I'm taking two minutes of time of people who have great amount of knowledge about Linux is firstly, uh, so first I would like to talk about the history of how things have happened. I have uh, read about the person who created Unix. Um, uh, um, also, I, I've forgotten his name now for some reason, uh, but I mean, so he created the kernel. Now he's come up with a new update. I read about his biography and I was very impressed. But if we look at the legacy of how it later on led to, say, the creation of Android by Google, which led to creation of hardware by China and the way it has, you know, led to creation of now. So today you have a, something called a Pine phone and, you know, um, they claim that if you want a completely, uh, you know, uh, audited hardware in US kind of a phone, that's going to cost you $2,000, $3,000. So that kind of speaks about security in terms of hardware. Uh, keeping that aside, in terms of what open source also has done, uh, and not maybe say talk about what happened to Edward Snowden or maybe, you know those kind of things like Julian Assange and those kind of controversial topics uh, is the idea that uh, there's always the idea of, uh, uh, you know, even if we create extensive security, there's always the issue that unless somebody can buy something like, you know, a Starlink kind of a broadband connection, uh, sorry, internet connection, uh, we cannot be able to have real secure internet in the first place. So to have this kind of uh, the idea of creating a secure uh, operating system is always, you know, like uh, <clears throat> I, I, what was this concept uh, created uh, by Godel, Escher and Bach kind of a thing, that book I read once, which is incompleteness theorem. So, you know, there's always one way to look out. And uh, I'm not talking about government surveillance or something like that, but the idea that anybody can sniff around anyway by way of say sniffing on the wire that goes out by the internet or say by a way of hardware. And uh, these are glaring issues. I mean, I, I'm not talking about, you know, maybe a revolution or something, but you know, this is a big issue. That yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Actually, uh, we did start an initiative. I don't have the time to get into that, but we started looking at an initiative from the Silicon up, security okay. from the Silicon up. Right. Uh, whether it's like, you know, not just the hardware, like the firmware, you know, the hardware, the software stack running, um, you know, what's the different level of data encryptions like, you know, all through across and also on the network. Right. For all the way from, you know, the layers of the network. Right. So there is a larger project initiative that was started confidential computing consortium. I think you should uh, check that out. That's basically trying to, you know, stitch these together like in terms of the entire server stack and the network stack, okay? But like uh, 
obviously like it's a big uh, ocean to boil so from the lfx <laughs> security we originally started more on the application stack and the software stack uh, but again it you know that's that's the thing like these communities are so uh, you know distributed you know um, this initiative hopefully you know starts connecting those bridges but i would highly so encourage I, you to look at the confidential computing stack so i i would have a look at that in fact uh, the idea was uh, to kind of conclude on, on this point with i, I mean my point on this that uh, if we really were to look at how technology moved from say the creator of unix who now sits with a server alone in a room where there is no sound at all but his own cat Uh, the only thing we can really come up with tangibly in the real world is what noam chomsky said the idea of you know uh, all those things that he says and uh, that doesn't really encourage anybody to want to go towards open source yet that is what we are doing now you know i mean um, i mean microsoft uh, stocks are going up but nobody wants to encourage microsoft and uh, open source on the other hand is moving rapidly and yet there, i mean everybody has a chance to you know so if there's too much diversity uh, uh, anybody can exploit also so i mean this is becoming a very dangerous situation as it was say compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago yeah no, uh, when yeah. when as compared to say there, there is no real globalization so to say true true no no absolutely and like actually like even from a lot of the government agencies who have been looking at like the expansion of open source uh, you know the trust trusted neutral uh, bodies like linux foundation we have gotten a lot of request across the industry to actually take the initiative on this okay so anyway i would say like why uh, i would love to chat more with you like you know you can drop me a note uh, i think we have one more question if if you are okay um, yep Yeah, so there was one question about uh, container scanning. Uh, Geva, you want to uh, add some? Uh, we don't currently have the yeah, information, let's, but let's yeah, uh, answer that something. question. Let's spend like one more minute here because I know we we are over time. So uh, yeah, uh, Geva could. Yeah, uh, I'll answer it quickly. So this is a feature. If you can hear me, this is a feature that exists already on the Sneak side, but we haven't uh, yet integrated into LFX and in high level. it's looking at your docker file it's looking at the uh, different open source components that are being pulled into that container uh, telling you similarly what vulnerabilities they have and what kind of fixes uh, you can do and also points out in terms of uh, improvements you can take like picking be- be- better best better base images that have less uh, dependencies and less vulnerabilities but are still likely able to run your uh, your application successfully So thank you. Um for any questions that we didn't get to or any other follow up questions uh please you know we'll we'll try our best to to respond to the ones that we might not have addressed uh, that have come through on this webinar but if you have any other questions you know feel free to drop us a question on lfx.dev/questions and we will get back to you. Um thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you Shibra, thank you Geva for presenting. and thank you all for attending uh we'll send the recording and follow up and uh please join us uh, for our next one that that will be coming up as well thank you